Gibbet Hill. Before 1832, a man by the name of Robert Crocker Bray came from England to Harbour Grace. A catechist, Bray started a seminary for young boys at the age of, of the age of 13 who wanted to become a Church of England priest. The priest's house, where Bray resided, and the graveyard were located near the present-day St. Paul's Anglican Church. Bray was not well-liked in the town. Bishop Inglis, visiting from Nova Scotia, stayed with Bray for a brief period of time and noted his impressions in the diary. Inglis said he understood why the people of Harbour Grace didn't like Bray, describing the catechist as a nasty person. Bray married in the early 1830s, taking a young woman from England, Sarah, as his bride. From this marriage, he received a substantial dowry with which he purchased a large plantation over 19 acres in Beers Cove on the northeastern shore of the town of Harbour Grace. To work to land, Bray hired four laborers, two from St. Mary's Bay, and two Irish immigrants to Harbour Grace, Peter Downing and Patty Malone. Downing and Malone had similar origins in rural New Ireland. Downing had lived in Harbour Grace for a few years, a farmer and a sealer by trade. He was married and had children. Malone, however, was a recent immigrant when hired by Bray to work on the plantation. Malone had only been in Conception Bay for six months. Known for his fierce temper and the hatred of Englishmen, he was rumored to have connections to clandestine world organizations in Ireland, those that committed sectarian atrocities across, across, against the English landlords. He was known also to be part of the White Boys, a mob. During his tenure, Malone lived on the farm during the weekdays and at a Bray house and at the Bray house on weekends where he was provided with meals and other necessities. In this context, Robert Crocker Bray was an Englishman and the landlords. And we can speculate about Malone's opinions of his boss through this lens. Soon after Bray's marriage to Sarah, the two had a child, Samuel Comer. The church then hired a servant girl to, to care for Samuel and the Bray home. The servant girl hired Ellen Coombs, and she was from Upper, the girl, she was from Upper Island Cove and was one of six children. There was a strong connection between the Church of England parishes in Harbour Grace and Upper Island Cove, which made the Bray home a natural fit for Ellen, and she was very satisfied with her job at the beginning of her employment. The area near the church and the Bray home was right in the middle of the blaze. Malone helped Sarah Bray escape the burning building and then helped put out the fire. The two Englishmen also helped. Subsequently, Bray felt indebted to them both and treated them well afterwards. During the fire, Malone spotted Bray taking money candlesticks, and other expensive items out of the house, the hidden wealth the catechist had acquired through years. After seeing this luxury, Malone devised a plan to rob the Brays of their small fortune. Even though he lived at the house, Malone had no access to the rooms which were locked. Therefore, if he wanted to steal the goods, he had to find a way in. At the firm, he told his friend and fellow laborer, Peter Downing, of the fortune. The two of them could easily get into the house and steal it, he said. They could cover their faces with soot to hide their identity at night and hold young Ellen Combs captive, then demand Bray, show them where his wealth is. Their plan was to steal the fortune, get clear of the house, and hide the stolen goods in the dark. The servant, Ellen Coombs, soon became a key piece 
in their scheme. Malone planned to include Ellen by making her fall in love with him, his way of gaining her trust. However, the poor girl was only a pawn in their game. Someone to dupe, string along, and throw away as needs must. And Malone, wretched dupe that he was, was soon successful. After that winter ceiling, the two had become lovers, and Ellen was on board with the men's plan. Her role? To unlock the doors and let the men quietly steal the fortune. So, the night they had been planning had finally arrived at July, a hot summer's evening in Newfoundland's second city. However, when Malone and Downing arrived at the house, they discovered the doors were locked. Today, we still don't know why the plan went awry, why Ellen didn't follow through on her end. What we do know is that a grisly scene soon follows, which left Bray, Ellen, and young Samuel Comer dead. Bray was struck over the head with an axe, and Samuel and Ellen had been suffocated. Luckily, Sarah Bray missed the fracas, having been away for the weekend visiting family in St. John's. To their dismay, the burglars found no treasure, just five pounds and Bray's watch. In their fury, they ransacked the house and lit the building on fire to destroy the evidence. They fled up Green's Road, today Garland's Hill, and came down by the Catholic Church property and buried the small treasure on Beers Cove Beach, near Ugly Head. Back at the house, the fire wasn't set well enough. All that came out was smoke. The fire department was called, and they rushed to put out a small blaze. Malone and Downing heard the fire bell and foolishly decided they'd go back and check it out and act like everything was normal. When they got there, people recognized them as residents and workers and therefore accused them of starting the blaze. The two were immediately arrested and brought to the courthouse. Downing's story remained the same during police questioning. We didn't have anything to do with the robbery or the murders, he argued. But not long after, Malone gave a contradictory confession. We did have something to do with the robbery, he said, but we didn't murder anyone. At the time, the local presiding judge was Dr. William Sterling, who lived on the property just west of Garrison House, in a house known as the Gordon Lodge. He was a surgeon by trade, and one of two magistrates in Harbour Grace. He was also the first chairperson of the local Benevolent Irish Society, the BIS, a non-denominational fraternal organization of Irish men. Sterling and the police knew Malone and Downing were the murderers, but they needed a confession, some proof, and the two men's statements contradicted one another. They decided to keep them in their cells at the courthouse, hoping that eventually one of them would look for a pardon, a way to get out. The case went to the Supreme Court in St. John's, with Judge Henry Bolton presiding. Brought to the province as a magistrate years prior from Ontario, Bolton was widely seen as an incompetent judge. To resolve this impasse, Bolton decided to offer something called the governor's pardon, a form of state's evidence, in Newfoundland known as King's evidence. Thus, if one of the prisoners made a jailhouse confession, the court would be much more lenient with the confessor who gave up vital information. After receiving this tip from a jailer at the courthouse, Malone turned snitch. He accused his partner Downing 
of masterminding the plan, of committing the atrocities. The court called Downing in and read him Malone's confession. He denied the story and blamed everything on Malone, specifically the murder of his girlfriend, Ellen, and the child, Samuel Comer. Once again, the judges had two separate confessions that completely contradicted each other, making it difficult to determine who the real culprit was. The trial went to St. John's, and for some reason, Judge Bolton discounted Downing's confession and threw, out the state, threw, out, threw the statement out of court. Nonetheless, the jury found both Downing and Malone guilty of murder and sentenced them to death. But because of the governor's pardon, Patty Malone got off relatively easy. Downing was not so lucky and was publicly hanged on, hanged on Market House Hill, St. John's. Now it was January 1834. After the execution, Peter's Down, Peter Downing's body was taken to Portugal Cove and then to Harbor Grace by ferry. Judge Bowden ordered it to be publicly displayed, to be left to rot and decay on a lonesome hillside in the community. So Downing hanged there in a gibbet, a rough cage for displaying corpses, with a rope around his neck, his two hands tied behind his back. This gruesome fate was a warning to the townspeople. Commit such crimes, and this could be you. Downing hung there for four months, from April, from January to April, while Malone, a free man, moved elsewhere. Unsurprisingly, some didn't take kindly to this violent display, namely the sealers of Harbor Grace. In the 1830s, sealers weren't the type of people who went to church or held hands. This time period in Conception Bay was exceptionally violent, with lots of strike ag agitations, political violence, property destruction, and murders. The power and violence of, of the mob really did exist. A rough bunch of people, the Steelers were furious with Bolton, a man of the city, for ordering this gruesome display in their town. As a former sealer, Peter Downing was one of their people, and they felt a sense of solidarity with him, even if he was a criminal. They thought, if he committed a crime, just bury him, instead of cruelly leaving him out there in the weather. They wondered why the other guy, Malone, got away with no consequences. Didn't make sense. Also, the Sealers had recently won a strike action against the merchant class in, in 1832, and this successful strike gave the Sealers plenty of confidence and fed their suspicion of the Newfoundland's elites. So in April, after that season's hunt, over a thousand Sealers from Conception Bay marched into Gibbet Hill to remove Downing from the gibbet. By this time, Downing's corpse was almost completely decayed, picked apart by the crows and the seagulls and the bugs. The man cut down his remains, stuffed them in the cork barrel, and walked them from the hill to the main path, today's Water Street, forming a crude funeral cortege. This demented procession wanted justice. Malone, they decided, should be hanged too, and Downing given the proper burial. The sealers stopped in front of Sterling's house, the former Gordon Lodge, opened the barrel, and dumped the remains on his front step. The judge, fearing for his life, and those of his 13 children hid inside the lodge. By the time he came out, 
the Steelers were gone. And there was a note attached to the remains. It said, Dr. Sterling, this is your man. You were the cause of bringing him here. Take him and bury him. Or look out, you should be the cause of allowing him to be put up there again. And we'll mark you for it. So do your duty and get him out of sight. Truly a friend. Anonymous Carboneer. Today, a fictional version of this letter is best remembered as Doctor, Doctor, test your skill, for I am downing up Gibbet Hill. Fearing reprisal, Sterling quickly ordered the body buried in the courtyard of the courthouse. We don't know the exact location of the grave. It has never been dug up, exhumed, or, or put somewhere else. Now, unlike his partner, Malone was never convicted. He had a brother in Bristol's Hope, then known as Mosquito Cove, and eventually came back to Harbor Grace and lived with him. Malone was charged eight years later with trying to set another fire in Bristol's Hope, but never went to jail. However, for his crime, he was deported back to Ireland. It's believed they had a powerful hold on someone in the area who protected him from a more serious conviction. And for this reason, in my mind, the Gibbet Hill story is remembered not as justice denied, but justice unfinished.